We really just need some context before today's reading, not a lot. Earlier in chapter 6 of Mark, which is you know, one of the four Gospels, Jesus taught in his hometown, but he wasn't received very well. Then he sent the 12 disciples out to heal people in body and spirit and to share the good news that life can and should be radically different. Toward the end of that time, news came that Herod had executed Jesus' cousin and perhaps mentor, John the Baptist. That's an awful lot to happen in one part of a chapter. A lot to happen in a short slice of life. So it was time for a break. Jesus and his disciples got in a boat and headed out for a quieter place than where they had gathered. They were really on a part of the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee. If you can get that in your head, in the northwest shore. But word quickly got out that they were in the neighborhood. People gathered to be healed, again, body and spirit, and they were hungry. Jesus found a way to get more than 5,000 people fed. And after the meal, Jesus tried again to get himself and his disciples some rest. They really needed a break. So he sent them out in the boat again, this time out to the northeast shore of the Sea of Galilee. Wait, I'm pointing in my direction. They went from the northwest to the northeast. How's that? Anyway, he himself stayed behind to climb up a hillside and pray. He would need that prayer because before the night was over, a storm came up and he had to go calm the disciples and we are told, calm the sea. Together then, all the disciples and Jesus headed back to the western shore only to be besieged again by people in need. Listen for what the Spirit is saying to the church as Joni reads. The apostles then rendezvoused with Jesus and reported on all they had done and taught. Jesus said, Come off by yourselves. Let's take a break and get a little rest. For there was constant coming and going. They didn't even have time to eat. So they got in a boat and went off to a remote place by themselves. Someone saw them going and the word got around. From the surrounding towns, people went on foot running and got there ahead of them. When Jesus arrived, he saw this huge crowd, and at sight of them, his heart broke. Like sheep with no shepherd they were, he went right to work teaching them. And then there's that little meal of feeding the 5,000. As soon as the meal was finished, Jesus insisted that the disciples get in the boat and go on ahead across to Bethsaida while he dismissed the congregation. After sending them off, he climbed a mountain to pray. Let God's words come into our lives to teach us something new. Amen. Well, I have nurtured hope that among the lessons we take with us from the pandemic would be that we don't have to live our lives so fast or stay so busy or work so hard all the time, all the time, all the time. It's an issue that impacts us all, whether we're still in the workforce or not. If you're retired, over the years you have seen your family less. Am I right? I'm so sorry, we're just so busy. I had dinner with a couple the other night and their son, and they hadn't seen him since April, and they all live in town. I've just been so busy, so busy. If you're retired and if you're in good health, you yourself might be busier than you were when you were working. Your volunteer energies are a hot commodity. 
You've likely noticed that as the speed of life has increased, the quality of our interactions has decreased. Not just socially, but even with medical professionals, am I right? Even with your minister. When I was discerning whether to go to seminary or law school, I thought that surely the life of a professor or a minister would be a less complicated choice than becoming a lawyer. I laugh about that now, sometimes. In my office and also at home, I have a small library of books with titles like The Hurried Child, The One Minute Manager. The One Minute Manager builds high-performing teams. There is even a book I do not own called Clone Yourself. That's probably the one I need. <laughs> I shouted amen when I read about Carl Honoré, who wrote in a book called In Praise of Slowness, how a worldwide movement is challenging the cult of speed. He said, my life had become an endless race against the clock. I was always in a hurry, scrambling to save a minute here, a few seconds there. My wake-up call came when I found myself toying with the idea of buying a collection of one-minute bedtime stories, Snow White in 60 seconds. <laughs> Suddenly it hit me, my rushaholism has gotten so out of hand that I'm willing to speed up those precious moments with my children at the end of the day. Oh, there had to be a better way, I thought, because living in fast forward is not really living fully at all. That's why I began to investigate the possibility of slowing down. I know personally, I have been trying to slow life down and yet do faithful work for over 30 years now. Without much success, I have to admit. Then three years ago, I stumbled on the secret to work-life balance. The secret lives in a Dilbert cartoon on my refrigerator. Do you want to hear it? Of course you do. Dilbert is saying, the secret to having a rewarding work-life balance is to have no life. <laughs> then it's easy to keep things balanced by doing no work. Asok the intern says, so simple, yet so genius. And Dilbert concludes, well, it was hiding in plain sight. I kid, of course, but it's the most popular cartoon on my fridge. It's the one I forward on to people more than anything else. We'd be looking at it today, but I'd probably be sued by the creators of Dilbert. Anyway, like I said, I kid about that one. But therapist and priest David Kuntz agrees that many today suffer from living on the mountain of too much. We've tried to deal with overloaded lives by cramming in more into each hour and cutting back on some things. Trouble is we've reached the point, I think long ago, where we couldn't cram more into the little time we had and we cut out pleasurable things like time with friends, time with family, to try to accommodate crowded schedules. He wrote a book called Stopping, How to Be Still When You Have to Keep Going where he reflects on three kinds of stopping. He talks about still points, which are little stopovers, little pauses, little, I'm sorry, still points, little pauses, prayer practices like we teach every month here, Tai Chi, Sabbath days. He talks about stopovers, which are longer, like weekends, weekends without work, retreats, vacations, sabbaticals, if you're lucky enough to get them. And he talks about grinding halts, those life-changing events like unemployment, retirement, illness, or injury. Even Jesus, especially Jesus, continually monitored himself and made sure that he took time to get away to a quiet place and pray. And sometimes he had to go to great lengths to make that happen, as we saw today. And even Jesus made use of longer still points. The Gospel of Luke especially is full of them. Jesus stopped and tried to get his friends and disciples to stop, even in the midst of pressing need. And he's not the only one. We read that Moses erected a tent called the Tent of Meeting at the edge of the Israelite camp in the desert. 
And Moses regularly took time from his duties to go to that tent where we are told that the Lord would speak to him as a friend speaks with a friend. Sounds like a stopover to me. And Paul wrote to the Corinthians, test yourselves to make sure you're on solid ground in the faith. Don't drift along and take everything for granted. Give yourselves regular checkups. More stopovers, right? Elijah, after his contest with the court prophets on Mount Carmel, was threatened by Queen Jezebel with death. He fled to a cave on a mountain, feeling despondent and alone. In that 40 days of grinding halt, he found God again, and God spoke to him in a still, small voice, saying, Slow down, Elijah. Sleep, eat, drink. And then tell me again how you got here. And consequently, Elijah's skewed perspective on events was sorted out. It's in slowing down from our hyperactivity that we give ourselves a chance to find God, to allow ourselves to be found by God, by the great love of God for each of us and all of us. Now, if you've been paying attention, and I hope you have, I hope you've picked up some useful ideas, and I also hope you're starting to get a little angry. So far, everything I've talked about is an individual solution. Have you noticed? Find a better organizing system. Read that book about cloning yourself or the one-minute manager. Slip in bits of time to pray. Find a few days to go on retreat. Take full advantage of your vacation or your sabbatical if you have one. But it's also a little bit like telling a frog in a pot of boiling water, think cooling thoughts. <laughs> Take a break from the hot water now and then. Or even reach out and turn the temperature down as if the frog is in control of those forces. Our culture has long railed against the idea of simplifying and slowing down. Busyness is our badge of honor. How are you? How have you been? Oh, busy, busy, very busy. Try getting into college these days without a long resume of achievements that starts back in elementary school. Our culture works against our slowing down, and so do those at the top of our economic system who thrive on our ever-increasing productivity. I think things changed a lot in our country in 1979 when the tax system changed significantly. I won't get into that too much there, except that just happened to be the time I entered the workforce, sadly. But between 1979 and 2019, who knows what the pandemic has done, Net productivity from workers grew, do you know how much it grew in those 40 years? It grew 60%. Did our wages grow with that productivity? How much do you think the wages grew? Guesses? 30, 25, 14, no, 16, 16%. Wages grew 16% while productivity grew 60%. In the same span of years, workers in the top 1% saw their wages grow 160%. 160%. And owners of capital reap huge rewards made possible in large part by the anemic wage growth for the bottom 90%. But have you noticed that there's change afoot? Frogs in pots all over America are reaching out and turning down the heat in a trend called quiet quitting. Have you heard of it? Quiet quitting. I read quite a bit about it, and as far as I can tell, quiet quitting doesn't have much to do with quitting at all. In fact, it, it's not even that kind of labor strike where you just do the bare minimum. Quiet quitting is doing your assigned tasks and yours alone. I would call quiet quitting doing your job. Closing your laptop at 5 p.m. or 5.30, whenever your day is done, whenever it's supposed to be done. Going home to your family, to your home, your friends. Not being available all evening and early morning for texts and emails or whenever your manager decides to reach out to you. Quiet quitting is saying no to a culture of overwork without additional pay. One project manager told NPR's Morning Edition, that actually the term quiet quitting is offensive 
because it suggests that people that do their work have somehow quit their job, framing workers as some sort of villain in an equation where they're doing exactly what they were told. She added, employers benefit from financially from workers doing extra work without compensation. That only makes sense. And it's only reasonable for employees to push back. Whether you're a frog in a pot or whether you're supervising the frogs in the pots, you may be a frog in a pot yourself supervising other frogs in pots, or you're the parent or grandparent or aunt or uncle or friend of frogs in pots, this Labor Day is a good time to take time to remember that our faith rests on the ancient story of God liberating the Hebrew people from slavery in Egypt. And the society that those freed slaves built was based on principles of fairness so that they would not slide back into slavery. Thou shalt not muzzle the ox. It was one of the rules that came out of that. And it turns out, if you pay attention, that slowing down can even be good for business. More than a few articles in the Harvard Business Review show that firms that go, 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 go to try to get an edge often wind up with lower profits than those that slow down and strategize to make sure they're on the right track. Well, to quote some theologians, Mae West once said, anything worth doing is worth doing slowly. <laughs> they stumble that run fast, wrote William Shakespeare in Romeo and Juliet. Come away to a deserted place and rest a while, said Jesus. In small daily ways and still points, little ones stopping and breathing, stretching, saying breath prayers, splashing water on your face in the restroom and saying hello to yourself in the mirror, setting a random alarm on your cell phone to remind yourself that you're alive, or using the ringing of a telephone, a red light at the intersection as a reminder to stop and breathe and say hello to God and yourself. Larger daily still points to slow down, like walking the dog, or gardening, or cooking a meal, or eating at a table, and talking with other people at the table, should you have company, and tasting your food while you eat it. And if you don't have time of the day to take these micro prayer breaks, if the schedule of your work keeps you from cooking, from sitting down to meals, from walking your dog, it's time to take a look at the boiling water of your work life and either find a way to turn it down or realize it may be time to jump out of the pot before it consumes you. We only have one life each as far as I know and we have all the religious legitimation we need to take care of ourselves. Come away to a deserted place and rest for a while invites Jesus. Try a stopover if you can, some time away preferably to a deserted place, which explains the popularity of the beach mountains or a change of scenery. And by the way, very wise of you today to be here instead of the beach, which is incredibly crowded right now, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> Some have found ways to take advantage of a grinding halt, a layoff, an illness, in order to reestablish their spiritual stores. And there is an entire slow movement involving evolving that we can attach ourselves to. Google it. Slow food, slow work, slow parenting, slow art, slow travel, slow sex, slow reading, even, yes, slow church. There is a website called the Ministry of Naps. And it is not a joke. It is not a joke at all. There's a group called the International Institute of Not Doing Much, a group committed to inaction. A few of their recommendations are drink a cup of tea, put your feet up, and stare idly out the window. When was the last time you did that? Don't be pushed into answering questions. A response is not the same as an answer. Ponder and take your time. Spend more time in the bathtub. Do people still have bathtubs? I noticed the remodelers seem to be taking them all out. Practice doing nothing. And avoid too much seriousness. Laugh because you're on the earth for a limited time only. Come away to a deserted place by yourself and rest for a while was Jesus' invitation to his disciples. And I believe his invitation to us. 
What could we gain if we did? Among other things, I suspect that we will find rest for our souls, a recalibration of our lives. Maybe we'll even find our souls, and find one another, and find God. And God will have a chance to find us, to love us, to lead us in, in ways more marvelous than we can imagine. Amen.